Concluding remarks. <laughs> Concluding remarks. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, first of all, let me uh, thank the Open Ukraine uh, Foundation for the chance to be here. Uh, I chose to do concluding remarks within a summary because this has covered so much ground over the last day and a half. Uh, I think really doing a fair summary would be very difficult. So I've chosen the coward's way out, which is to offer closing remarks, not a summary. Um, I'm also very conscious of the fact that I am the last speaker on the last day of a long conference, and I'm your only obstacle between you and a glass of wine. So I will keep my comments short. Uh, one last point. Uh, I am an American citizen, I am a retired American diplomat, so I'm speaking here for myself, not for the U.S. government. But let me just say that Ukraine has gone through a lot in the last two and a half years. Ukraine has had to deal with the challenge of Russian aggression, first Russia's seizure and then the illegal annexation of Crimea in March of 2014, and then Russian support for armed separatism in the Donbass. And when I say support, I use it in a very broad term. It's been Russian leadership, Russian money, Russian weapons, Russian ammunition, and in some cases, units, regular units of the Russian army. Ukraine's also had to deal with the challenge of reform, building the political and economic institutions that would put Ukraine on the path to becoming a normal, stable, democratic, market-oriented European state. And Ukraine has made some significant progress in that regard. Uh, the violence in the Donbass has been contained. Unfortunately, uh, it continues. The state ceasefire is, is, is shaky now. And it's been contained at a horrific cost, almost 10,000 dead. Ukraine has also made some progress in terms of reform, including some very difficult reforms politically. And the United States and Ukraine and Europe should support Ukraine. Uh, they should do it, first of all, because Ukraine's success or failure is going to have a huge impact on the future of Europe and on the European security order. But they should also support Ukraine because it's the right thing to do. Ukraine is the victim of Russian aggression. And Ukraine is receiving support from the West, but here I'm going to shift into a cautionary note. Ukraine should not take that support for granted. On April 6, in the Netherlands, there was an unfortunate referendum. That referendum was not about Ukraine. It was first and foremost about how the Dutch saw the European Union. But I think the image of Ukraine in March, a country mired in political, uh, a political crisis, questions about the country's commitment to tackle reform and tackle corruption, that contributed to a 61% no vote in the referendum. And there is, I believe now in the West, a risk of a return of Ukraine fatigue. And I think that risk may be underestimated here in Kyiv. So let me make some observations, first of all, about domestic politics here in Ukraine. And I say this with a bit of humility because if you look at American domestic politics over the last several years, uh, they become practically dysfunctional. And I'll blame David Gramer here, uh, the representative of the Republican Party, for that. <laughs> but you've had a period of three months now of political crisis here. And during that period in the West, people were watching, they were waiting, and they were wondering, how can Ukraine afford this political crisis when you've got Russian aggression in the East and you've got the critical reform needs? Now, hopefully, a new government's in place now, that government needs to move, it needs to begin doing things quickly. Because otherwise, there's going to be a risk that Western patience runs out. It's not unlimited. A second point on the pace of reform, and again, I want to repeat, I think there have been some very important and some very significant reform steps taken by Ukraine. Raising the energy tariffs a year ago, where you hit every household in the country, you know, that's a painful thing to do politically but it was necessary to get the budget in a better situation, and it was also a necessary step to get Ukraine's energy sector headed in the right direction. But having done those things, there's still a lot more that Ukraine's leadership needs to do, both in terms of economic reforms, but also in terms of tackling corruption. And it needs to move quickly on those issues to build credibility with the International Monetary Fund, with Western supporters, but most critically to build credibility with the Ukrainian people.
Ukraine can't afford to get bogged down. It can't appear to look like it's unwilling or unable to tackle hard questions and reform to get it on the path towards Europe. And the Maidan revolution, it generated a lot of high hopes and a lot of high expectations. And that was the case in 2014. Uh, it cannot afford now disappointment because Ukrainians and the West, we've seen this movie before. In 1994, President Kuchma came in with a burst of reform, hopes went up, and then nothing happened. I was here in 1999, in fact, the day that uh, Viktor Yushchenko was named uh, Prime Minister, we had a reception at the residence, and I could just, I mean, the Ukrainians were just elated. And again, a burst of reform, then disappointment. In 2005, after the Orange Revolution, President uh, Yushchenko and Prime Minister Timoshenko, high expectations, then disappointment. Ukraine should not let that happen again, because at some point you run the risk that people will come to the conclusion that Ukraine can't be fixed. And if that happens, what's going to happen to support in America and Europe for Ukraine? A third concern I have is about implementation of Minsk. There's been little progress in the last 14 months, and the overwhelming responsibility for the failure to bring Minsk into implementation rests with Russia and the separatists. There's no question about that. Analytically, I personally do not expect Minsk to be implemented. And that's for a couple of reasons. First of all, there's few indications out of Moscow that they want to bring that agreement into force. What Russia wants to do, I believe, is use the Donbass as an area of pressure, uh, as a frozen conflict or a not-so-frozen conflict, to put pressure on the government here in Kyiv to make it more difficult for that government to get on with reform or get on with implementation of the association agreement with the European Union. Also, you have leaders of the so-called People's Republics in Donetsk and Luhansk who say, we're not going to accept restoration of Ukrainian political sovereignty here. That's a bit of confusing because the whole point of Minsk is to restore Ukrainian political sovereignty over the Donbass. So with those sorts of arguments, with those sorts of positions, it's hard to see Minsk being implemented. But by the same token, that's the only settlement path on the table so for the time being, side should try to make it work. Now, it's going to be difficult to implement Minsk when the basic security conditions have not been met. The ceasefire, it's holding better than in August, but it's shaky. You've not had withdrawal of all the weapons from the line of contact. And OSC does not have its access to all of the areas of occupied Donbass. The responsibility for that lies mainly with the Russians and the separatists. But having said that, I think it would be unwise for Ukraine to assume that because those security conditions have not been met, Ukraine doesn't need to do anything more on Minsk. And my worry here is that the Russians are trying very hard, the Kremlin is trying very hard. You heard about the information war. They're trying to change the narrative. The narrative in 2015 was that Minsk was not being implemented because of Russian actions and the separatists. What Russia wants to do is portray Kyiv as equally responsible. And what they're looking at is July and the fact that unfortunately there are some EU member states who actually would like to get back to business as usual with Russia and would like to do away with the sanctions. And so I would argue that Ukraine ought to be thinking now about doing things to make clear it is committed to Minsk II and implementation because that can be useful to give ammunition to the Germans and the Poles and the Baltic states and the British who want to continue those sanctions until Minsk is fully implemented. So for example, the Rada might take up the law on conducting elections in the occupied part of Donbass, and it could lay out in that law all of the conditions that you need to have for a free, fair, competitive election. But again, I worry that if Ukraine doesn't do that, it may raise the risk that the sanctions are not extended and if the European Union does not extend the sanctions, Western leverage, Western pressure on Moscow is going to be dramatically reduced. Just a couple of other comments. Uh, first, geopolitical importance. Sometimes when I talk to people in the Ukrainian elite, one gets the sense that they may tend to overestimate the geopolitical importance of Ukraine between the West and Russia. That there, and I've even heard it in a couple of the questions that have been posed over the last day and a half, this sense that Ukraine is too big, too important to fail, and that regardless of what Ukraine's leadership does, the West is going to be there because otherwise the West would, it worries, 
that Ukraine would turn to Russia. And I've heard this in the past, even when I was in the US government, things were, if you do that, we'll have no choice to go back to Russia. Uh, I think it would be a mistake for the elite to make that assumption. If the elite make the assumption that they can engage in political games as opposed to actually governing, that they can go slow on reform, that they don't have to be serious about Minsk, they may find that, in fact, the West has turned away. Finally, just one last observation. In January of next year, a new American president is going to take office and move into the Oval Office. And he or she is going to have a very busy inbox. Lots of domestic issues, but it's also going to have a lot of foreign policy issues. How do you deal with a rising China? What about a nuclear North Korea run by a country that a leader who appears to be a little bit uh, on the uh, border in terms of sanity? How do you deal with the chaos in the Middle East? How do you deal with a bellicose Russia? Where does Ukraine fit in there? And the question is, what kind of Ukraine do you want the American president to see nine months from now? If it's a Ukraine that's still mired in political crisis, if it's a Ukraine that's not making much progress on reform, it's a Ukraine that's muddling along, there's going to be a temptation for that president to say, I'm going to let the Europeans solve Ukraine. And that's not good for Ukraine, and I would also argue it's not good for American policy. If, on the other hand, the president sees Ukraine led by a determined leadership that is making hard decisions on reform, that's really fighting corruption, that's doing the things it needs to do to get Ukraine on the path to becoming more like a normal European state, that's a potential success story that's going to attract White House interest, White House engagement, White House involvement. But what kind of Ukraine that the American president sees in January of 2017 is going to depend on the decisions that Ukraine's leadership makes today and in the next several weeks. So, so let me close. I, I, I'm a little bit, uh, I, I don't like to be sort of a, a pessimist at the end of this thing. I tend to be an optimistic person. Uh, but I think it, it's important to be blunt here because I do worry that unless Ukraine takes different actions, there is a return of the possibility of a return of Ukraine fatigue. And that's not going to be good for Western interests, but it's also not going to be very good for Ukraine. And this gets about perceptions and steps that Ukraine needs to take to show that it really wants to do the things, including the hard decisions, uh, to move down that path towards Europe. Those perceptions matter. Uh, those perceptions can be changed. Uh, but I would argue those perceptions need to be changed, and it can start with actions being taken by the new government in the next coming days. So let me thank you all again for, for uh, bearing me out in the last uh, presentation. Uh, let me again thank uh, the Open Ukraine Foundation for this conference, for inviting me uh, and making all this possible. And in particular, let me thank Teresa Yatsenuk, uh, the head of the Supervisory Council of the Open Ukraine Foundation. Stephen, thank you very much indeed. Very